for the afternoon sessions and bring to the stage the next panel, which is a case study, curators, and technology initiatives. with us today. Uh, we're ta talking this afternoon about technology initiatives, and we're going to talk about three case studies in particular. I think one of the most uh, exciting new responsibilities of curators in grappling with uh, new methods of delivery, and it is grappling with new methods of de delivery and balancing content quality control with increased expectations for access and immediacy in the galleries. We have heard already today about the ways in which changing demographics and new generations of museum goers require new kinds of not just presenting, but collecting for today's museums. And we are all experimenting with these ways of making collections available. Uh, finding the most appropriate uses for technology is one of the biggest challenges, but it's something that also offers one of the biggest rewards. Uh, we're, this panel this afternoon will be organized in a way that I'm going to explain to you so you know what's coming. We're going to do three case studies uh, from three different New York institutions, the Brooklyn Museum, the uh, Cooper Hood uh, Smithsonian Design Museum, and the American Museum of Natural History. I'm going to wait to introduce my colleagues from those institutions until we get closer to that part so that we don't have too many introductions all at once. Um, but first, we're going to hear from Malia Simmons. Um, many of us in the museum world and in this room today, in fact, have benefited greatly from Bloomberg philanthropies and their vision for the importance of using new technologies to make museums and their collections more accessible through Bloomberg Connects. Malia, the arts program manager at Bloomberg philanthropies, manages grant programs that support arts and culture at Bloomberg and uh, as part of the arts team, she is responsible for developing, implementing, and evaluating initiatives like Bloomberg Connects, which is a global commitment that provides funding for the development of technology to increase access to cultural institutions and <coughs> enrich the visitor experience. So, Malia is going to talk to us about Bloomberg Connects. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Malia Simons, and I work as part of a team to manage cultural grant making at Bloomberg Philanthropies. This is an entity that encompasses all of Mike Bloomberg's charitable giving, so that's personal, foundation, and corporate. Um, for those unfamiliar with Mike, he founded a company called Bloomberg uh, that, <laughs> that uses technology to provide information, so remember that phrase, technology to provide information. Um, it's primarily financial information like stock indices and market data uh, to the investment industry. He was also a three-term mayor of New York City from 2002 to 2013. Our approach to funding the arts has been developed with Mike's belief that the arts are uniquely effective at improving the economy, identity, and quality of life of communities everywhere. Most people experience the arts as an exceptional event, like a performance or an exhibition. This sense of art as a one-off can make it easy to overlook the fact that making and disseminating culture taps into a range of enormously powerful and positive <coughs> dynamics. Building communities, boosting economies, inspiring great design, and engendering empathy, imagination, and tolerance. Our goal is to support the arts in ways that trigger and sustain these dynamics. The history of arts philanthropy in the US has tended to focus on creating and supporting institutions. Our strategy embraces this approach, supporting institutions, uh, alongside what we see as the two other components of cultural infrastructure, artists and audiences. Let's focus on audiences. As you know, we've developed the Bloomberg Connects initiative, working with 14 cultural institutions around the world to use digital technology to increase access to collections, exhibitions, and information about art and culture for audiences on site and off. 
This initiative really began in the 1990s with Bloomberg's sponsorship of audio guides at museums as a way of giving all visitors the kind of specialized information previously restricted to people like you, curators, or who were curators. A little context. Mike began supporting the arts at this time and was on the boards of the Jewish Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He very much appreciated the customized tours he received from curators and even museum directors and thought, wouldn't it be great if everyone could go through an exhibition with a curator? Mike loves curators, and I'm not just saying that because I'm in a room full of them, but because he has great respect and appreciation for people who can synthesize information and provide it to the public in an interesting and understandable way. So when the opportunity arose to support cutting edge at the time, technology to deliver information about works of art to the public, he jumped at the chance to fund audio guides at several museums. This new visitor service would level the playing field by increasing and improving access to cultural content and use information and technology to bring art to life. In our current initiative, we're looking to support the most interesting and effective ways of expanding audience engagement. Our portfolio of 14 cultural organizations is quite diverse and includes nine art museums, two botanical gardens, one natural history museum, one performing organization, and one science museum. The initial class of five Bloomberg Connects grantees were selected in 2013 and comprised cultural organizations whose audio guide programs we had been supporting collectively for over a decade. Each institution was thinking about how to transform their audio tours to a mobile experience. And we supported the development of digital projects at the Art Institute of Chicago, MoMA, the New York Botanical <coughs> Garden, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Met. They each had a unique approach to engage their audiences. MoMA, being MoMA, took an encyclopedic route aiming to provide all of the museum's audio content on their app. The Art Institute, wanted to provide a fun entry point to its permanent collection, so they developed 50 thematic tours of 10 stops each for their app. The Guggenheim looked to their app to develop, to augment their special exhibitions with audio and video content, as well as provide a tour of their iconic building. The New York Botanical Garden wanted to highlight its summer exhibitions, and the Met, being the Met, wanted to do it big, have an app and online initiatives to bring its collection to the universe. What was exciting to us were the diversity of approaches and cross-departmental work that each of these institutions undertook to develop their projects. And that the enthusiasm and support for these digital efforts came from the directors, reinforcing the priority of these projects for their institutions. What also drew us to supporting digital projects is the experimental nature of the programs and the fact that our grants were really going towards research and development. For example, we didn't know if MoMA's camera feature could withstand the masses of visitors who might be using it. And sure enough, in the beta testing, it didn't. All of these photos crashed the system, but everyone learned from it and now it works beautifully. We've also learned other things about the users too. Visitors still love audio. So at the Met, rather than loading over 2,000 audio stops on their app, which is only available to iPhone users, they've put all of these stops on their new mobile website, which is accessible to anyone with a mobile smartphone. I could go on and on about lessons learned, like mapping, necessary or not, visitor information, how much is enough? but we'll save that for our discussion. One of the great aspects of Bloomberg Connects is that we convene all of our grantees twice a year to share successes and challenges and hear from experts in other industries who we hope will inspire our grantees. We are also very interested in sharing what we've learned in this program with other institutions because unfortunately, we can't support every worthy project, but if we're able to help others with best practices, this expands the reach of our grants. The good news is that people are engaging and using these digital tools. What we don't know yet is what this means in terms of meaningful engagement. The next class of Bloomberg Connects grantees funded uh, last, beginning last year are focused on developing digital tools to enrich the visitor experience. 
I will let these folks describe their projects, uh, but just know that we are very excited about the way things are going. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the three case studies. Uh, Sarah and I will speak first about what we're doing in Brooklyn, but first let me introduce everyone who's up here. Sarah Devine is the Manager of Audience and Engagement and Interpreted Materials at the Brooklyn Museum. Sarah is co-leading with Shelley Bernstein, uh, our Vice Director for Digital Engagement and Technology, the museum's Bloomberg Connect Visitor Experience Initiative. Sarah works with curators, designers, educators, technologists, and visitor services staff in every aspect of this interpretation and, and engagement. Uh, down at the other end is Sam Brenner, the interactive media developer at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Uh, Sam joined Cooper Hewitt in 2014 as a member of Cooper Hewitt Labs, the museum's in-house digital strategy and software development team. Sam designs interfaces and writes code to make the museum's collection easily available over the internet and user-friendly web pages. Uh, next to him, I believe, is Greg Herringshaw, um, who has been at Cooper Hewitt for a very long time, nearly 20 years, and is the assistant curator in charge of wall coverings. Uh, this is a major collection, probably the largest collection in the world, of, uh, or at least in the United States, I think, of wall coverings, uh, numbering over 10,000 pieces, dating from the 17th century to the present. <coughs> Um, in their presentation, Sam and Greg will focus on the acclaimed immersion room at the Cooper Hewitt, an innovative way of displaying and contextualizing the outstanding collection of wallpaper held by the museum, a collection that had previously been very difficult to share with the public. Catherine Devine um, is the Chief Digital Officer at the American Museum of Natural History. Catherine joined the American Museum of Natural History in 2012 and she is responsible for the museum's digital strategy, which focuses on driving, that on driving transformation of the visitor experience on site and online. And Ruth uh, Cohen, Senior Director of the Education Strategic Initiatives and Director, Center for Lifelong Learning at the, Muse the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, Ruth is responsible for the co-development and the management of the museum's education. Uh, at the American Museum of Natural History, the Bloomberg Connect project is still in progress, as it is here in Brooklyn. Uh, so Catherine and Ruth will talk to us about how they are developing content for Explorer 2.0 and how to plan for the most effective use of digital affordances in experiencing and learning about scientific phenomena from wide swath. So, Sarah and I will, um, will go first, and we'll talk about what we've been doing here with our uh, Bloomberg Connects initiative. When we started this process, I think we all were very interested in seeing how we could bring to the galleries here um, a, a technology in a role that would help promote curatorial goals. Uh, in the galleries, traditionally, we have labels and we occasionally have curators. The labels are the most obvious way that we communicate, the safest way that we communicate with our visitors, but I think none of us think it's the best way. We have a system down for labels, labels are easy, but as uh, Malia said, it's that, it's that conversation with curators that makes the museum experience really special whether it's for Mike Bloomberg or for individual uh, members of the community that we happen to have the opportunity of taking around the museum. And I think curators yearn for a way to make this experience um, broader, to allow us to have that kind of conversation uh, with the audience that we occasionally are privileged to have with individual donors or with individual audience members that we happen to have time to take around. Um, we hoped that what we were doing here would lead us along that line. We went through several iterations of this project, trying to reach that sort of moment when the curatorial voice could be transmitted to the public in um, an easy way. Um, and uh, th that's really what we've been trying to do throughout this uh, entire process. So in direct 
and real time, we sort of come upon a way in which we think this might work. I was the kind of guinea pig at the beginning of this process in which um, I was the curatorial content for the experiments that we were having with, um, with the public. I sat in a room behind a curtain, so to speak, and answered questions. I faced this project with trepidation and skepticism, worrying that, first of all, I wouldn't have the answers at all, and secondly, that, um, that the uh, questions wouldn't be very interesting, and the fact is, neither was true. I, I didn't have all the answers. There were certainly times when I wasn't articulate in answering and when the, the material wasn't right at my fingertips, but that's what this process is meant to do, is to build that body of information and good information that we can then begin to process out to the public. Um, so um, that building that body is what Sarah is going to talk about, how we went about the process of, of doing this. So one very important point I'd like to make uh, before we really get started is to share that although our, the project itself began in interpretive materials and technology departments, it was really a building-wide initiative that could not happen at all without everyone getting on board, and for that, we're extremely grateful. Um, so we've asked a lot of our colleagues over the last two years. This initiative has been two years in the making. And we began the initiative with a series of cross-departmental meetings that included curators, educators, designers, visitor services, security staff. And they, these meetings really gave us a chance to examine our own visitor experience. And the lens through which we were examining, doing the self-examination was this, this initiative goal, was to create a dynamic and responsive museum that fosters dialogue and sparks conversation between staff and visitors. But how do we do that? Um, so we spent a lot of time in these meetings coming up with lists, lots of lists, of things that we thought we did well, things that we thought could use improvement. But to really figure out, right, uh, hold that, hold the phone, hold that thought. I don't know what just happened here. There we go, okay. Um, but to make this large and potentially complicated project manageable, manageable, we adopted a planning process which is known as Agile. This is a planning process that software development firms use and it relies on breaking down what's a really large project into smaller, manageable, testable chunks that we did in rapid fire pilot projects. Um, most importantly about this process of it is it's iterative. That means that every pilot project builds upon the learnings from the previous one. And that was really important to us because we didn't know what we didn't know. We had these assumptions, but we really needed to test them. And we didn't know what the end game was. We just had this, this overall goal. Uh, Agile was really challenging for everybody. Uh, we relied very heavily on staff in the building to help us move quickly, um, often testing the limits, and I would imagine also the patience of many people as we constantly were badgering people with our need for speed to run through these projects very quickly. Um, our curator of decorative arts, Barry Harwood, Chief Designer Matthew Jakubowski and Vice Director of Brand Management and Visitor Services Elisa Martin were invaluable as an advisory board uh, uh, while we planned these early pilot projects. This is us mapping one of them out on note cards, um, being a sounding board for us as we move through these projects. And then after we developed and ran and tested each pilot project, we did town hall meetings to report the findings back to the building and talk about what the next thing we wanted to do was. So the first thing that we tested was our own assumptions. So what, what do we do well? Remember that list from our early cross-departmental meetings? We put people in the gallery specifically to speak with visitors and observe them. And what we learned by placing this small army of temporary gallery hosts in the, army, in, in the galleries was some really important things. One, the hosts were really well received. Our visitors not only loved to talk to each other, they loved to talk to our hosts, and they loved to talk about art which was something we weren't going to take for granted. So happily, they were talking about art while they're in the building with us. They were really chatty. Uh, they talked to our hosts from anywhere from one to five minutes, which is a pretty high level of engagement. Uh, and one of the things that kept coming up over and, over and over again was the idea of recommendations. They wanted advice on what else to see while they were here. And enough visitors asked about that idea that we focused on it for the next pilot. So beginning in the gallery areas that were chattiest, um, in the building, we worked with curators to select a handful of artworks and then provide a recommendation in another collection area. These are the cards that we provided. So visitors would be handed one of these cards with a recommendation to a connection object, a little bit about that object, and how to get there. It was a complete failure. Um, it didn't, didn't work at all. Sounded like a great idea, was great on paper, 
Visitors did not understand what we were up to. Uh, they questioned the reasoning behind the recommendations. They wondered what in the world that had to do with them. We actually had visitors say, what does this have to do with me? Um, so although the personal attention to the hosts, and the hosts were the ones delivering these cards, they would have a conversation and then try to hand it off, that personal attention stopped short when we tried to provide something that was pre-planned. So they want that guidance, but they want that kind of guidance and recommendation that comes from personal attention and, in short, through conversation. But the challenge with that is, how do you do that in a building our size? The hosts that we have were still like a needle in the haystack. You just couldn't find somebody if you needed someone. So we began to wonder, could technology help here? What if technology brokered this interaction? So we tested that next. What we did is we bought um, some iPods and we loaded them with iMessage, the you know, Apple text message, basically. And we invited a group of guests in and also tested with some random visitors that we just approached in the galleries. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, he was our expert during this testing session. So what would happen is we'd invite them in, we'd hand them the iPod, they'd have free reign of our American Identities Gallery. Kevin would, would talk, we would furiously type as he answered the questions. And then we spent some time speaking with the, the participants afterwards. And we learned some really important things. One, they love the concept. They love the idea of having an ex uh, access to this expert. Interestingly, they were engaged in the galleries in a more active fashion. They, they themselves said, I looked at the artwork more closely because they wanted to ask them questions. Um, and then most importantly, they didn't suffer from what we like to call screen suck. They were not buried in their phone, which is something we never want uh, with a technology project if at all possible. So um, that was great, and the experience was personal. So even though we had technology brokering this interaction, they felt like it was a personal connection. Um, and then interestingly, they used the device socially among the companions. We heard language like, we wanted to know or we, we, would, we would like to know more about, um, and that was really interesting too. So that ultimately led us to, our, to the main event, if you will, which is that visitors will be empowered to ask us questions using their mobile devices, and we will answer in real time, or as we're saying now, in as close to real time as we can possibly do, as we're in testing. Um, and it was about this time that thankfully Bloomberg Rankings came in um, and we were able to join the Bloomberg Connects team, which is exciting. Um, so in a nutshell, um, the components are our app, Ask Brooklyn Museum. We are currently in beta testing right now, as, as we speak, there was one this weekend. Um, and this app connects you to a team of specialists. Uh, these are art historians and educators who are currently learning about our, our collection, cramming practically. Um, they began in February, and the curators, our curators here have been really invaluable in not only selecting but training this team, um, who's been spending a lot of time in the galleries on their own, um, and a lot of time with curators doing tours. Um, and also, the curators have been um, generous in their time providing tours, research advice, resources, um, and all as the team learns about our very diverse collection. As we continue um, project rollout, as, it, as Kevin mentioned, um, we're still in the midst of rolling everything out and we'll continue to improve as the app gets in the hands of more people. Um, we're still assessing the impact on staff. Um, we've tried to be mindful of adding additional demands on curatorial time in particular and have hired a curatorial liaison um, to help with this. Uh, we're also trying as much as possible to tap into existing training opportunities uh, with education, visitor services, piggybacking on those things. So, and it's, it has been a process that has both been great fun and uh, a lot of learning because I have learned a tremendous amount in being the guinea pig in this project both in terms of what people ask and how one can best answer it. I think we've found that we can oftentimes provide more of an answer than they thought they were going to get. My fear was that we we're going to be able to provide less of an answer, but that's actually the opposite is true. And the other thing that's really important is that it provides a tremendous amount of data for curatorial learning that um, we hear what people are asking. We know when the same picture is asked about over and over again, a question that we never considered answering in the label. So that knowing what visitors are asking helps us decide what kind of information to deliver, however we choose to deliver it, on the multiple platforms that we use, label, acoustic guides, um, this, this app and other things that uh, constantly we're learning from the visitors in this process, what it is they want to hear, 
and which answers satisfy them. I frequently ask at the end of, in, during the testing anyway, at the end, did I answer your question? And it's uh, almost always the answer was yes or wonderful. Uh, sometimes it was no. So then you know that that's not quite the right answer for the kinds of questions that people have. Um, I think that whatever the future of this project is, and we do expect to evolve it, this is a project that we hope to evolve as we learn more and more about it, whatever the future is for it, I think we're going to end up learning much more about what the visitor needs in our galleries and how it is that we can best supply that. talking to you about the new emerging room at the Cooper Hewitt, and we just want to start with a brief video clip. Okay, so as you saw in the video, the Emergent Room is an interactive gallery where visitors can project wallpapers from the museum's permanent collection as well as create their own designs. The main objective behind the Emergent Room was to highlight a rather unique collection of wallpapers and to increase accessibility to the collection by creating an interactive gallery where a large number of wallpapers could be shown. Okay, projecting wallpaper in the Emergent Room solves a number of installation problems for the collection. It can be difficult and expensive to frame wallpapers as many of them are oversized. And there also tends to be a shortage of gallery space or shortage of wall space in the galleries. And when wallpapers are framed, it takes them out of context and they appear more like works of art and are no longer perceived as background decoration. And some wallpapers are too fragile to hang, need to be laid displayed horizontally in a case, which is not ideal. So by projecting the wallpapers, they can be shown in repeat covering a full wall, and they can be viewed as they were designed to be seen. And when possible, wallpapers on view in the gallery can also be accessed in the immersion room. We started with an initial group of 200 wallpapers from the museum's permanent collection, which kind of showed the depth of the collection. Each paper is projected with a short caption. And to make the experience more interesting and informative, about half of the wallpapers have related content, which is displayed in a window on the side of the panel. This content could be the wallpaper into two, it could be other work by the designer, or it could be other collection objects with a similar theme. And there are also brief audio clips by top design professionals speaking on inspiration. And some of the wallpapers are displayed with multiple coordinating borders, so visitors can mix and match to experience the interaction of different, wall, different patterns. And as you saw, visitors are also encouraged to play designer by creating their own wallpaper on the touchscreen table, which can then be projected. The visitor designs a single repeat, which the software then repeats in a tile format. And the digital table includes a number of options for manipulating their designs. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the um, production and the infrastructure we have in place that allows us to build uh, you know, uh, exhibitions such as the wallpaper immersion room and also the, uh, the pen that we also put into place with the Bloomberg um, support. Uh, so at the, uh, kind of th this, this diagram shows our overview of our technology stack. Uh, so at the base, everything 
um, is built off of TMS, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, so we have a process that uh, extracts uh, all of the images and all of the uh, object metadata out of TMS, and from there we can turn it into an API. The API is kind of a more standardized format that works over the internet, and this allows us to build our own collections website, and then it also allows us to personally build uh, you know, a whole range of, of interactive experiences based on our um, based on our museum's content, but it also allows us to, um, because the API is public, uh, we can invite students, we can invite um, other um, exhibition design companies such as local projects in, in the case of the immersion room where the people who uh, built it. So, you know, it allows us to share our museum's uh, metadata and allows these experiences to be created. So that's why the pen and the gallery apps are at the top of this diagram because those are, you know, fundamentally interchangeable. We could, um, you know, using the foundation of the API, we could design any number of uh, in-gallery or online experiences based on our uh, museum's collection. This is just an example of what an object looks like when it comes over the API. You can see all of the, um, well, maybe you can, it's tiny, you're not meant to see it, but, <laughs> you know, information like the title, the accession number, um, all of the, the texts that have been written about the objects of what shows up on the label, um, maybe what uh, appeared um, in a publication. Um, so additionally, uh, in the case of the immersion room, there was a need for uh, additional metadata um, on the, so this is a tool I designed to, that allows us to extract the um, repeating pattern out of a wallpaper. Um, when it's photographed, you, um, you know, you have the registration marks along the side, it might be slightly rotated, and to get it to display in the immersion room, we need to kind of identify the, the repeating pattern of it, crop out the registration marks, and maybe rotate it. So I'll, I'll just play this again. Uh, so on the left is the original photograph that we have, and then I'm just dragging out a uh, bounding box, and I think I rotate it a little bit just to roughly match it up. So then this information also gets saved to our API and is combined, so all of that data that originally came from TMS, such as the title and the images and everything, now we can, through the API, we can supplement that with additional information, such as um, right, the, the repeating part of, of the wallpaper image. So I save that, and now that's uh, available over the API. Um, additional tools that needed to be built to facilitate the immersion room. This is uh, kind of the administrative interface for adding a new wallpaper to the immersion room. This is something that was, has gone through many different versions. Um, so this would allow Greg to, you know, if he wants to add a new wallpaper uh, that's not currently part of the 200 that are there, that he could go in, uh, enter the accession number, add it, to say, you know, show up in the immersion room, add, you know, we, we uh, require tags and related objects so he could enter those here and then um, do the, the cropping as well from the previous tool. Um, another thing the API allows us to do is to kind of close back the feed, uh, close the feedback loop on um, what people are using the, uh, using the immersion room to create. So these are just some examples that I pulled. Uh, last week of uh, some of the visitor created wallpapers. Um, so everything that happens on the tables, because all of the, visitor, uh, all of the visitors have a pen that is tied to their ticket, uh, they can choose to save their wallpaper, which is then linked to their account. Uh, and they go to a URL that's on their ticket, and they would see a page like this, which shows the wallpaper that they created, uh, that same URL would also show all of the objects that they collected, maybe one of the wallpapers from our collection that they were inspired by, um, or anything else that's on display. Um, it also allows us to 
you know, if there's any other interactive uh, piece that functions to, uh, you know, create something new in the gallery. So we have a, uh, it's called Sketchbot, and it is a little robotic needle that draws your face in the sand. Um, so when that's done, it takes a picture of it and uploads it via the API to our, um, to the visitor's visit page. So all of that information is uh, collected on the web for them to share, uh, to serve as a reminder of their visit to the museum um, forever. <laughs> uh, that's it. Thank you. is Explorer app. This is an app that we've actually been involved in with Bloomberg Philanthropies for um, many, many years, actually predating my time at the museum. But uh, it was originally done in 2010. It was really to, to um, address the issues of three questions or three or four questions that visitors ask. Where am I? <laughs> what would I like to see? What am I standing in front of? And, you know, and what is significant about this. And I think that this is something that um, for our museum is, is really relevant. For those of you who've been um, to the American Museum of Natural History, it is an enormous place to get around. And personally, it took my, myself three months to actually learn how to not get lost. So this was a really, really big need of our visitors. So we released this in, in 2010. We're currently working on an Explorer 2 release, which we're going to just deliver at the end of this year, in December of this year. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what the significance of that is. And also Ruth will talk a little bit about how we went through that process of, of uh, defining that. So we, as I said, the key, the key drivers here were ex simplifying the experience of navigating the museum, providing a level of interpretation. So how do we answer that question of, um, what am I standing in front of and why is it important and what should I know about it? So as many of my colleagues here have said, it's about, it's about how do you have that curator um, like standing next to you uh, discussing things. And also, this is where we, we're heading now, is into this idea of an integrated digital physical experience. So there was a long time where people thought about experiences being um, purely physical or purely digital. You either came to the museum or you had an app. And now we're running to starting to bridge that very, uh, so it's, it's, it's not so much uh, distinguished one way or the other, it's very, very um, integrated. And so we're now we're trying to get into this idea of things that are very immersive and how do you um, not so much feel like I'm, I'm in the app or I'm in the museum, it's much more the, the, the app is as an extension of that experience. Um, and the other, the other thing that we're trying to start to get into is this idea of personalized experiences. So rather than one experience for everybody, it's like what is the thing that, that you are particularly interested in and how can we help you steer you towards that and understand that better. So these are all the drivers um, that we have. As I said, Bloomberg has, um, Connects has generously funded this um, and supported us through this and given us great leadership through for many years now and uh, for which we are very grateful. Um, so I said in uh, 2010, we released an iOS app. In February of 2015, we changed the wayfinding. Wayfinding, uh, from a technology point of view, was a really difficult problem. And uh, we changed that, and we've actually put 700 beacons throughout the museum. I don't know how much you're familiar with beacons, and I think Brooklyn Museum has some. Um, but we actually put 700 um, beacons up throughout the museum to support the algorithms around how to find your way around and what all those routes are. Um, we also did an update to a very contemporary look and feel. It's really important in the technology space that you remain looking like you are in the year that you are. Uh, <laughs> um, unlike many things, it, it just dates so rapidly. It can date over six months, so um, that shouldn't like. Um, scare us at all, but it's something that we want to really be aware of because our visitors have very high expectations um, about what they expect to see in the rest of the world and they expect to see it in your apps as well. So we've adapted to a very contemporary look and feel here and 
And most importantly, I think we've extended this to Android. So we have an iOS app and we have an Android app. And this extends your reach um, significantly. So people will tell you that 80% you know, of the phones out there are Android phones, and that is true. Um, it doesn't extend your, your, your reach 80%, but what, you know, something like 30 or 40% increase um, will come from Android. And that means that that's a whole market that wasn't being served um, from, from this. Um, some other things here. Sorry, just I'm conscious of time. So you know, we, it was important to us, and you heard Cooper Hewitt speak about this: this idea of, of an architecture. The architecture is very important, so that you can build this in a sustained way. Um, we continue to do beacons, and I think so. Now moving on to Explorer Two, the uh, there was a time where. We wanted to solve the problem of how do you get around a museum and then what am I standing in front of and how do I get information? And then that, that world has moved on. Now we're getting into what I call contextual and experiential. So contextual meaning um, the right answer at the right time at the right place to the right person. So, and it, this is a really difficult thing to deliver for us from an experience point of view and also from a technical point of view. But I think it's really important, this, this, this idea of like, rather than have to get out my phone, press a few buttons, find information, it's like more like I'm standing in front of a beautiful piece of art or I'm standing in front of um, Tyrannosaurus Rex. And it's like, it just appears. It's just a seamless, what we call in this industry, frictionless, a frictionless experience of being able to um, just the information that you need appears for the person that you are. That's one. And the other one is this idea of experiential and Ruth will talk to this a little bit more, this idea of uh, being able to um, be much more immersed in it, this bridging of the physical and digital. So with that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to attempt to speak and set up this at the same time, which is not always successful. Um, what uh, the other major question that visitors want to know is where's the bathroom, and that's what Explorer does that's true. very well. Um, there we are. Um, so the what we're going to talk, what I'm going to talk, speak to a little bit more is um, on the content areas, what we're focused on at the museum in terms of digital learning, and how do digital affordances enable, enliven, and enforce, in this case, scientific concepts. Um, the, oh, there we go. And this is uh, the, the kind of central principle of science visualization, right? So you want to see um, concepts that, that are very abstract and very hard to understand. And this is the way we used to visualize science, which maybe to a room full of artists has some beauty, but is pretty incomprehensible. And then we go forward and we can, in our old space show, we can see this sort of science visualization. And I want to emphasize that these visualizations in astrophysics are based on real data. These are all real data sets that are then interpreted in these beautiful visual images so that you can understand what the universe maybe looks like. We want to move even further with this. Um, how do I fix that part? doesn't look very good, does it? Can you see it? Anyway, what we want to do is go even further to look at a more immersive kinds of um, uh, digital affordances that allow you to see things in 3D within the halls that's going to enliven the halls. Um, I want to focus a little bit here on what we're um, concentrated on, which is our primary audience of children and youth. So we invented, and we'll have some other slides which show the games aspects of what we're looking at in terms of digital, both mobile and stationary. This is one about pterosaurs, which has an AR version, which allows you to see how a pterosaur flies, or how we think a pterosaur flies. And again, what we're really talking about here in terms of a science museum or a natural history museum are the things that you will never see, extinct environments, um, the universe, uh, microscopic environments. So we want to uh, really showcase this. This is a game called Micro Rangers. Those cute little critters on the bottom are microbes and what they do to you. Those are the explainers on top, which also appear in an AR version. 
These are, we're doing some experiments in Minecraft and other games-based learning. Here's a cute DNA game we're developing as well. These are all now in prototype. So when we're looking at Explorer 2, as Catherine pointed out before, we're looking to connect our halls to authentic and ongoing scientific research, the stuff people can't see, make it contemporary, create compelling storylines, and illustrate the big ideas, the things you cannot see. And to, um, to, our, to the question from our colleagues before, from Malia, where can we deepen engagement and how? So two big ideas, concepts that we're working on currently are the digital universe as a signature experience and tree of life. And so as you can imagine, those are both big topics. They're big areas that the museum is well known for that we can look to immerse audiences in even further. Um, as you'll see, we're looking to zoom in, we're looking to bring existing halls even more animated and more into life. The Tree of Life, evolutionary history, biology, how can you use an app on a mobile phone to see where these different mammals or organisms connect with each other in evolution? Um, so these are some of the content areas that you will hopefully see in Explorer 2.0. here, I have some questions that came to my mind while we were talking, and I'm sure some of the other panelists have some as well, and then we'll ask for the audience questions uh, a little bit later. But first, um, uh, Sam and Greg, I wanted to ask, we had our uh, development process to get to where we were, what the project was we wanted to do. How did you come upon... It, did it come to both together, or one of you individually, that this immersion room was the white right thing to do, or was it a process? Um, I think it was, well, it's like my committee, I think there were a number of people talking about it, working out ideas on how to get more access to this wallpaper collection. So as I was saying, it's very difficult to display, but it's really a unique collection in the United States. And I am totally clueless about technology, but fortunately there are other people on staff who know how to work with it to your advantage, and I kind of know what they were collections, so it's just, yeah, I think it's just a mutual conversation. That, I mean, I think we found that, too, that it's, it's hard to believe that some curators don't know a lot about technology. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sometimes we found we were speaking different languages, trying to get to the same place, um, and I think sometimes that leads to the feeling that maybe the curators are just providing content and somebody else is doing the design. Did you find that you reach a place where, in fact, we're both designing the project? I, well, I, I think the, uh, the I, I, a lot of the uh, decisions for the design and the development of the project were in place by the time I had joined the labs. but. Um, I think that, specifically in the case of the immersion room, there was, you know, at first it was just going to show the wallpapers, and then also um, uh, local projects, who, the people who uh, uh, implemented the front end of it said, well, how about people um, draw their own wallpapers, and then, you know, we saw how they were tied to the system with a pen to save everything to your account. So, um, yeah, there was that element of conversation there, and personally, I think having, you know, even though a lot of the development was done, um, you know, by another, by a, a third party, I think having the labs and, and a, a small dedicated technology staff in house kind of <coughs> helps facilitate the conversation between vendors, curators, you know, anyone who's working on technology. But you know, you know we can come at it from a perspective of. Uh, you know, being a, a part of the museum and having to you know, spend a lot of time doing the, the nitty gritty of the implementation of it. Um, and yeah. That, <laughs> and did I hear you say that there were 200 wallpapers on, on the database? Yeah, so I said we should That was what you started with. And was that because you decided that was the right number for 
what people could accommodate, or was it because of just the time? That I they think it was it? just a nice, manageable number, and it still gave people a good assortment of wallpapers so they could kind of see the depth of the collection, that it wasn't overwhelming on our part, since this is all new to us, it's just you know, a very strong learning curve. So yeah, it's just a manageable number, mm -hmm. which we can just you know, build on. Build on. You plan to do that, yeah. And Ruth and Catherine, how, how did you develop your project? How did, it, how did it come about and what kind of collaboration? We uh, set up a group last summer called the Explorer, <laughs> infamous Explorer Innovation Committee. Um, and uh, this, was, this was an interesting test for the organization. We, we intentionally took people who we knew to be innovative and forward thinkers rather than someone who was a representative of each department and got them together in a room and really we came up with so many ideas but then we ultimately had to come down to what we were actually going to move forward with. But I think that was, a, I don't know if you want to comment on it further Ruth, but that was an interesting, that was an interesting um, experiment for us. It was um, one of the first times that a cross uh, departmental group had been tasked with coming out with something and everyone was excited about the opportunity and I will say the first meeting is what you throw out. So everyone comes and all these ideas come flowing out and then at the end of the meeting, Catherine and I turn to each other and say, well, we don't want any of those ideas. And then we start it all over again. So the, uh, the, the process, uh, I think, facilitated that important feeling of um, we can fail, we can have bad ideas as long as we keep working with each other and off of each other's ideas. Um, you guys said that you uh, had originally thought about incorporating wayfinding in this and jettisoned that. What was oh, no, no, we, no, we do have wayfinding. Do wayfinding have, was there from the you very solved beginning. that. Yes. Okay. Um, the thing about, um, I realize this is not technology audience, but technology is an ever moving thing. So the technology that, that was put in place in 2010 needs to be replaced constantly, and, and it's also there are new and better ways to do things. and so. One was about changing out that architecture. Um, and, uh, but no, wayfinding I think will always be the core component, but now it won't be the, you know, the, the only reason to have the app, or the major reason to have the app. It's, it's there in the background, um, but you want to think about location in a different way. Okay. And that your, your comment about the expense of this is, is essentially is pretty important, I think. I mean, this is an expensive process, and Bloomberg Connects has been very important to all of us in being able to do it. Lee, do you have any advice for smaller institutions working on this on a smaller scale? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that we have learned is that a lot of these institutions, while we're providing um, you know, major grants to them over multi-years, is that there are still th some things that they're looking to others to perfect before they take on. So I think that that is something to think about. Like this, you mentioned wayfinding. I mean, the Museum of Natural History has been lucky to have a partner in a um, Meridian, a company that you know has helped them provide them with these beacons, so they can install 700. Still takes their man hours to put them up, but they don't have to purchase them. You know, and I think a lot of other institutions, even in our our grantees, are looking at them to see how that shapes out before they move on. A lot of folks are looking to Shelley and Sarah to see how ASK turns out, you know, before they do some things as well. So it, you don't necessarily have to be the first um, unless your institution or organization has an enormous appetite for uh, challenge. <laughs> um, but it is good to keep abreast of what your colleagues are doing so that you don't have to repeat those mistakes or those expenses or there are always ways I think technology, as Catherine said, is always evolving and there are always ways um, to, to use it in more effectively and more efficiently, so. Yeah, I think we found that here, that um, there was a point where I think we were happy that we didn't jump in a generation earlier because the generations are so short that it's nice to get in when we feel comfortable doing it and 
think that we can make it work. I'll just add that, you know, an institution like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I mean, they have a wonderful app, but there's no map on it. You know, and that's a place similar to the Museum of Natural History. It's a beast, it's a giant place, and sometimes you don't know where you are. But they're working that out. Again, seeing what other institutions are doing, what even Google is doing or Apple is doing in, um, in airports, in stadiums, in other industries, hotels, hospitals, you know, in terms of wayfinding to figure out what works best for them and what's the most cost-effective way to do these projects. This question may be self-evident, or the answer to it may be self-evident, but is technology in galleries inevitable? Is there, is it, is there a choice to not do it, to stay with low-tech <laughs> gallery communication? Well, I think there's a couple of answers to that. I think you should have, technology is just part of the equation. We shouldn't consider it as something different. However, putting it in, I mean, I'm not a curator. Putting it in galleries, I think, is, is a very, uh, can be very challenging. I think mobile and wearables is the way to do it because it's much more invisible um, and you don't ruin the aesthetic and the experience. It's a very, it's a very uh, interesting uh, kind of challenge. But, um, but I don't think that we can say because it's difficult to put in galleries that we shouldn't do technology, but we need to think a bit differently, such as mobile, so it's a bit more invisible. Um, yeah, but I feel strongly about having okay. it. Well, how do you think we develop the content differently uh, for that? I think, for, that I think for, for mobile, the, the temptation is, as it was back in the early days of technology, the temptation was when we built websites to take our print materials and put them on websites. And now the temptation is to take our websites and put them on mobile devices. And what we really have to think about is that the experience of using each of those devices, each of those channels, is a very different experience. And the experience, it needs to be relevant to the experience that you're in. So I think that's, you know, th there's often many conversations about, you know, how do you edit down that content to be the, to deliver it in the right way on mobile. And that's a really difficult conversation for institutions to have. Um, but I think it's also incredibly important, and more so when we get to wearables. So when we get, I don't have an Apple Watch. I wasn't allowed. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but when we get to Apple Watches and things like that, then you know we have what we call glanceable content. So the idea of just content that you're just going to glance at that gives you something. Um, so I think it's di writing differently for different channels. Um, I would like to add to that, and I think the reason in our museum where education was partnered with digital and we had curatorial uh, representation on our committee as well, of course, is that we took the challenge of digital to be a new way of learning and to look at the different levels of learners that we had as visitors. And so one aspect may be pure fun. Um, it may be a way for a, an eight-year-old to envision something differently and new that doesn't have a really deep level of learning that's gonna stick with them and maybe send them someplace else. And then another level is going to be more of a pursuit or their own individual scientific investigation or inquiry or understanding. So, so that the label copy is always important because people want to know what it is that's in front of them. The contemplative aspects of museums are always important because people are going to, there'll probably be quiet cars in galleries. Um, and but then to, re to respond to the ultimate challenge, which is, to, which is relevance, which is deepening learning, which is offering an alternative to school-based or kind of reading as learning, our museums are all primed for that, and that's what we want to take advantage of through digital tools. Do you have questions for each other? <laughs> About your project? I, I guess I have another question for, for you. Your, your project seems to be encapsulized. You've got something out there in the, in, the, in the public sphere. The advice to those of us who are still in the middle of doing it, is there anything you would do differently? Is there something we should not do that you did? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I think in the case of the immersion room, it's a very, you know, it, it has a specific focus. Um, we have the infrastructure in place that allows us to easily, I mean, yeah, I think why I talked a lot about the API uh, in my portion of the presentation was that having that infrastructure in place allows ideas for, uh, you know, how we're going to choose to incorporate technology into the web or into the galleries. Uh, you know, it allows those ideas to come from anywhere. Uh, you know, we have the immersion room, we have a lot of just small prototypes that we make and share among ourselves for you know, ways to see new images 
searches or what is it to, you know, search by color, for example, you know, new ways into the collection and that, yeah, and, and then also to, I think you guys said, uh, you, you throw out the first round of ideas. So the, <laughs> the more ways that you can kind of allow ideas to, you know, come from anywhere, I think, um, I guess that would be mm -hmm. any advice I have for people starting a project, I don't know, but in the middle of the <laughs> project. Yeah, it was definitely a trial and error, but I, I have to say it was definitely worth the effort. I was just telling Sam on the way over here that I get such a thrill walking up the second floor and seeing this big crowd of people in motion and everyone's just having such a good time. And mm -hmm. it definitely it just makes it worth the effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're really enjoying it. It's, I mean, my big goal was to just make more of the collection accessible. And it's totally doing that. It's inspired people to make their own wallpaper designs. And it's just really been a great project. Good. Yeah, in, in thinking about what both of you are and other institutions are doing, I find that there's something comfort comforting about the amount of control you have that frightens me a little bit about, we have the wild card of having human beings interpreting in the middle of our process, interpreting the material, which I think is, I'm hoping that will be its great success and asset, but it's also a little, Scary. You mean in terms of the ask? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's completely visitor driven, so it's not us being the instigator of the content, it's the visitor being the instigator of the content. So we don't, they could ask us anything. And yeah. it's up to us to figure to out the answer and to respond way. appropriately, which is a wild card. I think that's yeah. a fair statement. So is I don't know an appropriate answer? <laughs> we try not to do it very often, but, but uh, it's, 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 uh, as you know from, from, from all kinds of training, it's better to say I don't know than to yes, the wrong exactly. answer. <laughs> so it's, it's sometimes hard for us to do that, but I, I think the better answer is we'll find out for yeah. you. Um, because again, I found in doing the, the experiments myself that a lot of times when I didn't know the answer, it wasn't because I didn't really know the answer, it was because I think the question wasn't exactly what they meant to ask, and I gave them information that I thought was really interesting based on their question, and then asked them if that worked. And they say sometimes, once in a while, they said no. But usually they were pleased with the information they got. We use prize by the sorts of questions that people ask. Completely. Yeah. I mean, not just the sorts of questions. I mean, some of them were obvious, but the fact that certain questions were asked over and over again, and that they weren't the questions that I would have answered in a label. Right. You know, frequently, I mean, one happens so often that a question people want to know about a picture is, where was it? Where was that bridge? What street is that church on? Mm -hmm. You know, this notion of locating mm -hmm. um, themselves within the, the picture um, seems to be important. Um, and then, the, you know, our galleries, I think, are like many museum galleries in that we have chat labels for some objects and not for others. And we find, found that certain things that were not labeled were getting a lot of questions, which makes us think, well, maybe we need a label for there. You know, maybe we've chosen the wrong thing to think that people understand without a label. Mm -hmm. So I, that's just, as I said, one of the things that I think is really interesting is the way the feedback from this helps us not with just with this project, but to envision how we need to be thinking about communication through our various um, levels of and channels. Yeah, I think there's an interesting tension between what, what the museum wants to communicate and what visitors want to know. Right. I think that's a really difficult one to, you know, I'm not an expert on solving it, but I think, yeah. it, I think it's a really difficult one, which is um, I suspected that, but don't know that they, they're asking different things than what we want. That, that we want. I think yeah. there's, a, you know, if you can imagine a Venn diagram, I think there's an intersection exactly there, which is right. probably the sweet spot that the museum is. That's right. I mean, I think there's certain things that we tell them that they're thrilled to be told that they didn't know they wanted to know, but on the other hand, there are things that, that they need to know that we're not talking mm -hmm. Well, I think that's actually almost that sweet spot. It, yeah. in, our, in our beta testing so far, what we're hearing from visitors is when they're most excited about using the app is when they had a question and we answered it, but we get, then we give them that little bit extra. It was that little bit extra of information, and maybe it was, it was that tension between, well, I have this question, 
And so we'll answer it for you, but then we're going to give you this other bit of information, which is maybe one of the things we want you to know about it. And it takes them from a good, oh, great, you're answering my question, to, oh, that's super interesting. Tell me more. Yeah. Um, and that, so far, that's been working pretty well. Yeah, and I think some of the most interesting exchanges have been the ones that have gone on through two or three levels, not mm -hmm. just that's one right. question and sense. one response. It's been the, the, the ones that have become a conversation. And then are those conversations available to other visitors? Not, not yet. now. Uh, not now. That, in, in future iterations, or, or down the road, so this is a, a three-year rollout, um, the app being one part of it, uh, we're exploring uses of the conversations on digital signage. Um, but one of the things we want to know is, is that actually compelling? You know, what, what part do, so far we actually are hearing from people that they're enjoying reading other people's conversations. Um, so for example, we had a glitch where you could still see the previous conversations on our iPads for a while, and our testers would be going through looking at that and finding it really interesting. Like, oops, we weren't supposed to see that. But they found it super interesting, and I think that has something to do in general with people being interested in other people's thoughts. I mean, some of our best day rates are with our sticky notes where people are leaving thoughts in galleries and visitors are spending minutes upon minutes reading them. So I think it's kind of part of that same same idea, only mm -hmm. with information added. So, and something we'll be exploring as we roll out is what to do with that. I think we should uh, ask for questions from the audience. Yes? I think somebody's bringing you a... that we're interested in uh, exploring. We have had several conversations um, with a lot of the folks here, um, Shelley, Loic, and the Met said, about um, open sourcing, sharing the code from some of these programs that we've supported. And I think uh, a lot of times the conversation comes down to we can certainly share it, because Cooper already does share some of your code, right, for some of your things. You yeah, put well, it up there. A lot of the code and all of our collections. Yeah, but can other institutions or, or smaller organizations actually use that? Because if they don't have someone in place like, like a Catherine, a CDO, or a technology you know, expert, is that really helpful or useful to them? Um, one thing that we're thinking about perhaps doing is sharing information as simple as, you know, RFPs, or how do you get a digital officer? How do you advertise for that? Or vendor information? What kind of vendors you know have folks used? Um, or staffing? Or a little bit um, less technical and more, I'd say, practical um, information. I'd just like to add to that that um, I, I can't speak as to whether the museum is is. Uh, would share our code, but I don't know that they're opposed to it um, either. But I think I, I don't come from the museum world; I come from the commercial world originally, and um, and I really can't help but notice the difference because in the in the museum world there is a lot of sharing of ideas, like so, such as this. You know, um, so we're all learning from um, what each museum is doing, and we do this all the time. This is not just on these panels; like we're very aware of what everyone's doing and talking to each other. That doesn't happen in the commercial world at all. And uh, because they're competing against each other, and I think that that is that is the tremendous opportunity here. So even if we don't go as far as open source, I do think that um, there is a lot of sharing going on. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Thank you. I had two quick questions. One was about issues of privacy. 
um, if any of you had to deal with the kinds of information that visitors are providing or when they're asking and answering questions, what types of precautions may come into place regarding protecting the privacy of the folks who are engaging in a very public way with what's online. And then for the folks at Cooper Hewitt, um, with the pen, it looks like it's a lot of fun. And I'm also wondering if um, there were specific learning objectives that are measurable um, from having that type of access. Oh, privacy. I guess I'll start. Um, we follow Apple guidelines, uh, and we collect no information. Um, we are using iBeacons to locate a visitor in the gallery, which all that does is pull up the artworks that they're near in our backend system. Uh, we don't ask for a name. We don't ask for an email address. None of that. Um, what we are working toward, however, is trying to more personalize the team on our end. Um, they will actually ultimately be stationed in the lobby, so you'll get to see who you'll be chatting with. Um, if we get to the point where we can't answer a question, which is bound to happen eventually, we will offer to take their email address, do research, and get back to them if they would like to share that with us, but they absolutely don't have to. Um, so I think we have a very good legacy here of protecting our visitors' privacy, and we'll continue to do so with our app here and, and gather and keep nothing. Um, and actually, um, we're geofenced, so as soon as you leave the building, you can't ac actually even access our app. It's only available to you if you're here in the museum, because we want to engage with you while you're here looking at our artworks. Uh, not, we're not meant to be outside experts outside of your time in the museum, so no public research papers outside of, <laughs> outside of the museum. Uh, could you restate the question for us? It's not against fun. I think something should be done just for fun. But I'm wondering, in addition to the fun and access element, are there certain specific learning objectives that were part of the project? And are those measurable somehow? Like, do people know anything more about the wallpaper other than just being able to see and engage with it? Each of the papers is projected with minimal caption information. Um, I don't know if they record or if they store the information of which ones are most looked at or what people are interested in. Yeah, uh, well, in the, yeah, in the case of wallpapers, I mean, we try to put it in context. We, we relate it to other, uh, you know, if, a, if it might appear with a certain dresser, right? We, we would present that dresser. Um, as far as the, the rest of the pen experience goes, uh, I mean, I, yeah, our, our initial launch of it um, was mostly just to get people collecting, building their own personal collections, um, exploring the collection on the tables with no specific um, I mean, with no stated educational opportunity in mind besides exposure, but of course, you know, now we're in a position to plan for the future, and obviously the plans do have a lot of educational opportunities, um, but yeah, not immediately, but yes, in the future. Actually, one of the things that I thought when I was watching your presentation that was very educational was when you showed how wallpaper patterns are a repeat and how that is constructed, that sort of mathematical, architectural right. notion of a repeating pattern, which you don't always know when you look at wallpaper. Right. Um, I think is something that is almost, you're almost forced to learn if you do the, the example that you, you have there. Yeah, and you could, you could spend a long time explaining drops on how to have repeats at you know twenty five percent down, or you could just have someone drag it right. and see it. So yeah, there's the definitely the uh, you know, learning by doing yeah. process for sure. Hi, hi, Nancy Rossoff, Brooklyn Museum. I have a question about the immersion experience. The, the technology, the hardware, how has the maintenance of that equipment been? Have there been any problems with users using it? Has it, you know, broken at times or? Uh, we had to replace the projector lamps, but that's, we know that's gonna happen. 
Uh, no, no one's no one's banged on the tables too hard. They're pretty resilient. Um, I think the the wall that it gets projected onto gets smudged occasionally, but we can just we can paint over that. Um, yeah, nothing's gone. I mean that there's. Um, you know, the cases were designed in a way to allow for, uh, you know, fans and air circulation because they, they, that could potentially be a hot room, but it hasn't, it's never, it's never too bad. Um, yeah, nothing's gone too wrong. I think the only thing I noticed one evening when I was there was that the bulbs were flickering. Yeah, that's right. They were there was trying to do these selfies, but the lights kept coming out and they were just like washing out the pattern on the wall. But I think that's the only thing I've noticed, the only little glitch, which has yeah. been dealt with. Mm -hmm. So it's been pretty smooth. Hi. Um, all of these mobile apps seem like a great opportunity to enrich the visitor experience while they're in the building. But I imagine that there are institutions who might want to reach to audiences from afar as well. And I, I realize this particularity of your specific goals with the Ask um, Our Team project here at Brooklyn. But I was just wondering about maybe possible applications for off-site engagement through either an app or a web equivalent of that. Um, and how you might either use it to bring in new audiences or just engage people who are geographically too far to have an opportunity to experience um, your building? Great, that's a good question. Um, so one of, the, one of the other things we'll be looking at as part of this project is a website, redesign is a strong word, um, a, a second look at the website, taking this content, basically, because one of the things we're really excited, as kind of noted, is all of the things we're gonna learn with this content about what interests visitors in the building, and what I'm interested to see is, how that translates to visitors not in the building and what interests them. So how we can add this to the website in a way that's engaging um, is one of the questions we have. But we also know from many of our past digital engagement projects that the engagement with us very much radiates out physically from the footprint of our building. Um, so the people that are most engaged with us live next door, basically. Um, so unless we decide to, to really reach out to other audiences with something specific, I'm not sure that would happen. And as of right now, that's not a goal, um, but I, that's not to say that can't happen um, overall as part of this, um, just because we've chosen very specifically to focus on the people within, within our walls. Um, but I am sort of hopeful that this different type of experience, which to echo a little bit on what Catherine said earlier, it's only one opportunity and only one way to engage with us, uh, among many, um, that this kind of personalization might bring people in in a way that they didn't know because they didn't know it existed before. Uh, because we can reach people on a very personal level, that, that might bring new people in who never thought to visit a museum before or just hadn't visited us yet. And that would be the cherry on top as far as I'm concerned. Hi, I'm Shoshana Resnikoff. I'm from the Terra Foundation for American Art. Um, and I'm uh, always really interested in questions of um, how institutions negotiate a uh, kind of fascinating but fraught issue of um, the institutional voice. And I think that um, the Ask Project seems like it is uh, full of potential with that, and, and as are you know, the other ones as well. And so I'm curious, especially with training the people who will be staffing um, those desks, what your approach is <coughs> in thinking about um, how, how people are interacting with it. That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that we're doing with our team is to spend as much time as the curators are able <laughs> um, to learn what the institution and curatorial vision is for each collection. Um, and that's where a lot of the, the tours have been extremely helpful. Um, and the team that we have hired is very cognizant of this. They understand the importance of institutional voice um, and having, being able, they understand this tension, that they're kind of this intermediary between the institution, between our curators, between our visitors, and they're, they're taking um, 
a lot of us on their shoulders and have very, this, taken this responsibility very seriously. And our, the first few times we tested, they sort of had a freak out about, oh my God, if I don't do this right, I really have to get the right answer and, you know, et cetera. So um, having a, a team that's really keen on that is important as well. Um, but one of, the ways that, one of the ways that we're training them and one of the resources they will have is we're doing a wiki. Um, and for now, it's internal, but um, one of our purpose hired staff, our curatorial liaison, is helping to facilitate this. And that's to work with our curators and curatorial assistants to come up with wiki entries, um, one for each collection that, that lays out that overview of what this curatorial vision is for each collection, what the strengths in the collection are, what are our bragging rights, if you will. Um, and as well as things like um, outdated terminology, things you don't say, things you do say, um, all of those kind of information about how to talk about the collections. And then within that, they're also going to do individual wiki entries for ideally, eventually, every object on view. Um, so we were starting with 10 per collection, and we're going to continue to just delve in. Um, and that's actually a kind of a side legacy we're excited about, because like I'm sure many of us, we have a lot of information siloed in many areas around around the building, and so we've been using this as an excuse to sort of gather all that information from different departments and try to put it in one place. Um, so we're spending a lot of time thinking about what the story is and how to share it, but at the same time, giving the people who are answering the questions some wiggle room to be themselves and to have some personality shining through the app in inappropriate fashion. And we've actually had some, some of our testers comment about not spelling things correctly so many times and not like they wanted to know there was another person on the other end because you, you're texting. So if you're texting with a friend, you know, particularly some of the demographic using it, it's emojis, it's, you know, smiley faces, it's misspelled words. Uh, we haven't really been doing that and I don't know how far we'll go with that, uh, but they kind of were digging us for not doing that because it didn't feel so personal. So finding that balancing act between, well, we're still a museum, but I don't know how many emoticons we're really going to use. We'll see how that goes. We just, um, we just went through an, ex an editorial exercise for how the um, information on Explorer 2.0 would be worded because the museum may be known as a kind of stodgy place in terms of its wall and label copy where you get the, the name of the species and its Latin name and you know some kind of drier, just uh, straight out facts about what it is that you're seeing. So we had kind of three different versions, one formal, maybe more usually associated with, with uh, American Museum of Natural History, one more informal, one more like, you know, smiley face, LOL, look at that big whale. I, and so, um, and, and it, was, it was a very, very fruitful conversation about where we felt we could bend a little bit and be more informal and where we wanted to ensure that people were getting that, that kind of scientific fact. So it's a, it's a very important point and a very important exercise. I, I have a very simple question, and you may have said it during your presentation, but, but you said that um, your uh, project was based on API. Um, what is that? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, API stands for uh, Application Programming Interface, but um, what, what it is for, uh, as uh, many museums have APIs, many tech services, you know, Spotify has an API. It, it, allows, people, uh, it allows developers or the public to um, uh, work with your institution's collection in a predictable way. So they, uh, for example, someone makes a API request. This all happens over the internet. So they make a, a request to our API endpoint uh, that might be uh, objects.getinfo and then accession number equals whatever, and then they'll get back the info on that object, or maybe uh, object.getImages, or exhibition.getObjects, and you know, so it's just kind of like a, a neat way to package up our uh, collection data for dispersal over the internet. Uh, it allows developers to make their own you know, their own visualizations, their own browsing tools, their own searching tools. Um, yeah. Dan, Danny, look up, please. Yeah. Um, just a quick question about uh, Carnegie um, Museum of Art. And 
Um, how much have you found that your pens and your immersion experiences are um, intuitive for the user, or have you had to have human facilitators kind of helping people to, to navigate through these um, cool things? I have found, I mean, it's been my experience that most of the younger people just go right in there and they just start going at it on the table and you know, they're drawing their designs and they're flipping through the collection objects. Some of the older people need a little encouragement. They're kind of standing around watch, kind of a to mm -hmm. coerce them up to the table and show them how much fun they can have. So it really depends on, yeah, I think on the age. We're, yeah, we're, we're still kind of playing around fine-tuning the script that the front desk staff, yeah. how they introduce the pen, how they describe it, maybe do they hand you off to another person who's dedicated to the table for maybe a small training session. We're still trying to uh, play around with as many different um, ideas around that as possible. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Hi, I'm Caitlin Pendell, and I'm a curator at Cooper Hewitt. So this question is actually for the Brooklyn Museum, but the Cooper Hewitt people can jump in if they want. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about the change in workload for the curators at the Brooklyn Museum, and my experience at Cooper Hewitt has been um, awesome. We produce this amazing content, and it's continuous. Um, we're adding to it all the time, but it also has added a layer to our jobs that didn't exist before, and it wasn't. It didn't replace something. It's been added. So how has that impacted you? Uh, I think there's no getting around that. That you know, this is uh, this is something that I think as an institution we've decided we need to do in order to communicate. In, you know, as we move into the future, and yes, it does add a layer. Um, we've tried here to make it as painless as possible. I mean, I think uh, on the one hand, the curators want to convey this information, so it's, it's, it's internalized as something they want to do, and the process we're trying to make, you know, with the liaison, with the, the, with the communicators, we're trying to make it so that um, it's, it's as it's the least taxing possible, but there's no question it's going to add, add work reviewing the, the material. Um, it, and it's not just adds work, but it creates a new opportunity, as I said before, for learning that means that there's yet another layer. That if we are going to take advantage of understanding what this communication with the visitor allows us to learn as curators, then that means another amount of time still devoted to following what's going on and internalizing it. So, um, yes, I think that's true. I saw down here. Yeah. Hello. Uh, just a couple. Oh, sorry, Xerxes from the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, just a couple of. Um, quite practical questions. One is, um, speaking to museums, and in fact our own experience, is that there's quite a lot of barriers still to visitors downloading apps uh, and then working out how they work on their phone. Um, and, it's, and so there's a question there for anyone about um, what is success? You know, is it 1% of people using it? Well, it's first downloading it and it's then actually using it as they wander around the museum. And so what does success look like? And ha what are we all doing to remove those barriers so that, so that large numbers of people actually download it? And then the second question is around investment and ongoing investment, which is you've, you've alluded a couple of times to how these things need to be upgraded quite often, whether it was replacing beacon technology with something else or, or making something look new. Where is it that, as museums, we should be investing millions in like the major infrastructure things to do with technology? And where is it that we should be knowing that something will disappear in three years or four years? Mm -hmm. And how do we decide when to do what? So, sorry, those were two questions. But. <laughs> I think to address 
the first piece around you know, removing the barriers. I think there's a couple of things. Um, it's a myth that 100% of people um, use smartphones and use all the features on smartphones. However, there is lots of information around how that is uh, very um, demographically based. And so, as the guys from Cooper Hewitt were saying, you know, the young ones, they just jump into this stuff. And it's not necessarily even limited to young ones, it's what they, you know, people who are just embrace digital you know, types of things. Um, so success is um, hard to measure, but it can't be 100% because the rest of the world is not there yet. However, um, it needs to feel relevant to the group of people who will embrace it. And if you go out many years, then I think you'll find that that percentage gets larger and larger. But another one around barriers is um, also with the help of Bloomberg, we have um, a fantastic Wi-Fi network. Um, so Wi-Fi is really important to uh, visitors to our museum because they are, many of them are international visitors, they don't want to use their data plans, um, obviously. But I think the other one is, how do you ensure that you have an app that has, and this is a difficult technical, there are many difficult technical questions here, but how do you get an app that has a really, really small footprint to download <laughs> and you don't, you know, someone's not going to stand there for half an hour trying to download it because they, they just won't. Um, so I think that that's, uh, so that we're very conscious of that and we're very conscious about loading content on demand. So only when you go to that part of the app do we load content. And a lot of what um, the guys from Cooper Hewitt were saying about APIs, not to get into too much of the technical details, but they're really important from an architecture point of view because it allows you to surface content when it's needed and not download it all in that initial footprint. And I've forgotten the second part of your question, but I probably couldn't. Yes. <laughs> Gets more expensive, and you judge what to make the investment on, or what to do. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really hard one. Um, I think the thing is, is you you have to constantly invest in technology. It doesn't necessarily need to be super expensive, though. Right? You can work out a way to um, not make it. You know, it doesn't need to be millions of dollars. The millions of dollars, well, maybe not millions, but the, the large investment is the first time you build it, and then you need to find a way to continually iterate um, through that. But it's a, really, it's a really difficult one because if you don't have technology, your visitors expect it. And if you do, you don't want it to overwhelm the rest of the experience. Uh, we, we took a slightly different approach. Um, so bar barriers to downloading, to address your first um, question, one of the things we found that works best is people. And that's actually all right, my answer to both of your questions. Um, so as I said, this, the team will be stationed in the lobby. We're also going to have some dedicated folks who will be not tied to their computers answering questions, but helping people download, explain what this thing is, invite participation. If somebody needs to be go step by step to download it, we'll help them do that. Um, we're also going to do some training sessions so that security guards and any other front of house staff feel comfortable helping visitors with that as well. Um, so that's a hope for barriers, as well as also a better Wi-Fi connection, which we have now, thankfully. Um, and then as far as updatable, one of the things we made a conscious decision to do was to keep the app side fairly simple, um, at least from a user standpoint. You're basically text messaging and taking photos. What's infinitely changeable is people's behavior around it. So because our container is very simple, how people use it is infinite in the sense that it's just texting, right? So the experience that we set up is changeable by how we learn that people are using it, how we want to encourage people to use it, and that interaction with people and how we invite participation can change as people's use change. Um, that being said, we will, we're, we're rolling out what is known as Agile as minimal viable product, so it's the simplest version of the Apple iPhone app that we can do right now until we figure out what, if any, bells and whistles are needed in addition. Once we perfect that, then we start looking at, okay, is Android next? probably, you know, our other platforms next, once we figure out exactly what it is that we need as a package. So we're taking it in sort of two tactics, if that, if that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, just in the case of the Cooper Hewitt, we, we didn't talk too much about the pen, um, but, you know, so we opted not to have an app at all. All the visitors get a pen, it's free, you get it with your ticket. Um, and that's kind of your gateway into all of the rest of the experiences, the immersion room, the, the collections tables, and, and the labels. Um, doesn't depend on the internet. Uh, and then you, know, you just go to the URL on your ticket when you get home or whenever you choose to, uh, and it will be there. So, I mean, yeah, I think that was how we worked around. And so it, it creates all different uh, metrics for 
for measuring success. Um, investment, I would say, yeah, the kind of the the ease with which people can access your data, your museum's data, because that's not going to change. That moves at the pace that the museum has always moved at. So, um, I mean, to me, that that seems like as a, as a developer that, that a museum that makes its data more easy for me to work with greatly expands my options for you know, what I can do with it in terms of execution when it comes to yeah, a digital uh, project. And I'll just add that, I mean, for us, success is, you know, every quarter we ask our grantees to provide reports on our people using what we're supporting, how are they using it. We haven't quite gotten to the point where we can understand what that means in terms of engagement, again, sort of meaningful engagement, but, you know, this is just, as someone said, one entry point into the museum. So you could go to the Cooper Hewitt and not use the pen, but you would be missing out on it, an amazing experience. I mean, you could also use your finger if you were afraid of the pen, um, you know. You, you know, if you don't use the app for the Museum of Natural History, you might not find how things are connected, you know, from gallery to gallery. If you don't use Ask, you won't get your unique, specific question answered by a human being somewhere. You know, the point is not to support tools and technology that take you away from the collection or what you're supposed to be experiencing, but, but that they enrich and enhance your experience. And so, We'd like to think that we're supporting tools that people are actually using. We'd like to understand how they're using them so that you know, maybe these, these institutions can go back and assess and readjust or you know, maybe folks aren't watching videos so let's not you know, produce more videos. We just continue with the audio content. Um, so that's really you know, what success looks like for us. And then just a note on the barriers. I think one of the things that um, sometimes we don't do enough is, is you know, marketing or outreach to people, letting them know that these things exist, right? So if you want to have an enriched experience, get the pen when you walk in the door. If you want to know where you're going or where the bathroom is, you know, download the Explorer app. Um, if you want to ask your personalized question, do that. So I think that has a lot to do with it. And what Sarah was saying about people, having your visitor services people also be familiar and comfortable with these digital tools is extremely important so that they can encourage people to use them. I think that was a wonderful summary <laughs> of everything we've been talking about. Thank you, Malia. Thank you to all of the colleagues on the panel, and thanks to the colleagues in the audience who had such great questions.